Good morning and welcome to the service for the difference. It is the 10th of September 2023 and we are in the season of discipleship. We have been on a journey in the season of looking at how Jesus is teaching his disciples how to be disciples of Christ, how to be uh, a part of the kingdom of heaven, how to be a, a part of the work that God is doing on earth as it is being done in, in heaven. Um, and we have been looking at how Jesus introduced his disciples, and we're looking again specifically at Matthew. He has been introducing his disciples to to the kingdom of heaven, what it looks like, uh, because if you want to be a part of it, you, you need to know what it's all about, and you need to know what it looks like. And then he has explained that the kingdom of heaven is love, God is love, and God needs to be the source of everything in our love, um, our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. God needs to be the source of all of that as God teaches us how to love as God loves. Um, and then we were looking at how discipleship is not an ideology. Being a Christian is not an ideology. Believing in Christ is not an ideology, but it it's a practical thing. It it is it is a part of who we are. It's not what we believe, but it's but it's who we become as we fall deeper in love with God and begin to see people as God sees people and, and love people as God loves them. And we are on that part, Disciple 202 we are now, the fourth part of, of this journey that we are on, um, the fourth, fourth section of this journey that we are on. And we are looking now at how discipleship is, is quite costly um, because it costs us everything. When you go into a relationship with anybody, it costs you. Everything costs you. Um, and so as we allow ourselves to be transformed into the image of God, into the nature of God, so we need to let go of, of something and it costs us letting go of those parts of ourselves that are not from God, but those parts that go against God, that break down, that destroy. So we need to let go of that stuff and, and it costs us that. And last week we looked at how Jesus was just helping his disciples know and, and look forward, look ahead, you know, keep moving forward. When when it gets tough, when the, when the message gets tough, when the work gets a little bit difficult, just keep moving forward. You don't know the full picture. The full picture is that the kingdom of heaven comes on earth as it is in heaven. Um, and so even though it looks like it's a bit difficult, just carry on moving forward. And that was the conversation that he had with his disciples where he told them that he would be dying. And obviously they didn't want to hear that. Um, and today we are looking a few, few pieces on um, from that conversation. Straight after that, Jesus went up um, on the mountain. He was transfigured with Peter, James and John being there comes down the mountain, he is heading towards Jerusalem, and they get to the bottom of the mountain, and the other disciples have been trying to heal this demon-possessed boy, they can't, they ask Jesus for help, he heals them, tells them it can only done, be done by fasting, this kind, um, but you can see he's, he's starting to get a little bit tense with the disciples, and his conversation is getting a bit shorter, obviously he's, he's experiencing a lot of tension, anxiety, because he is heading towards Jerusalem, towards his suffering, towards his, his crucifixion, after Jesus has healed the demon-possessed boy, he again predicts his death and his resurrection a second time. They go into the temple. He speaks against um, ritual that, that is meaningless, that is empty. In this case, it's the temple tax. They leave that place. The disciples are arguing about who, who's the greatest, and Jesus warns them against the temptation of pride and against the temptation of becoming like the religious leaders who now see themselves as, as better than others. God God wants all of his children home, and that's our work. Our work is to bring all of his children home. There is no one that is more or less than us, or more or less worthy of the kingdom of God than us. And then today's reading comes from Matthew chapter 18. We are, we are reading from verse 15 to, to verse 20, where Jesus is having a, a difficult conversation with his disciples about how to, how to deal with a believer who sins. They've already come to faith in Christ. They're a part of the community of faith. Um, how do you deal with a believer who is sinning, who is destroying community, who is breaking things down? Um, and so he takes them on this journey of this is how you how you need to do that. And then we are also going to be reading today from Ezekiel chapter 33. We're going to read from verse 7 to verse 11. God is having a conversation with Ezekiel saying, I'm going to give you a message for those who are sinning. Um, if you don't give it to them and they die in their sin, then you are an accomplice. You're as guilty as they are for their sin because you didn't warn them against what they were doing wrong. And if you do warn them and they still choose to, to follow their folly um, and they die in their sin, then it's their guilt. It's, it's not on you. And, and when they ask you, how do we get out from under the weight of our sin? 
um, tell them to repent because God doesn't delight in the death of a sinner. He doesn't delight in the suffering that we, we experience as a consequence of our sin. Um, and so when we repent, God leads us in, in the direction we need to be going and we avoid the consequence of our sin by not sinning when we follow where, where God is leading us. And then we're also going to be reading from Psalm 119. We're going to read from verse 33 to verse 40. Um, in this section of Psalm 119, the psalmist is just asking God, please teach me your ways. Turn my heart towards you. Turn my heart away from everything that is not you. Turn my heart towards everything that is of you so that I may be righteous because I, I want to be as righteous as, as you are. Um, and again, I'm going to ask that you put this on pause. And as you put this on pause, we give God thanks for it. And we pray that he will bless it to us as we reflect on it in, in this moment. As we continue our journey of looking at how costly discipleship is, um, we are looking this week at how we need to keep our hearts open, even when it is very, very difficult for us to do that. Um, you know, when we when we have reason to feel justified for our hurt and our pain and our and our anger, um, we need to keep our hearts open to those who have sinned against us. And and the question that is often asked of me is, you know, if if a church is meant to be the place we come together to worship God, it's, it's meant to be a family, a family that is born by the Spirit, not not born by blood, but born of the Spirit. So in other words, they are they are closer even than than blood. Then then how can there be conflict in the church? How can the faithful not agree with each other? How can those who are on the same journey to to holiness be at odds with each other? And and I think we really do struggle with believers who who don't agree with each other. And Jesus knew that there was going to be disagreements. He knew that there was going to be, be conflict. He knew that we weren't going to get it right as believers. And we would need to help each other in, in our journey of faith. We would need to correct each other um, when, we, when we didn't love as well as we should be, be loving, when we destroyed in, instead of building. Um, the disciples have just been arguing about who would be the greatest. And if Jesus didn't stop that conversation right there, obviously it would become something a whole lot bigger. And they may have ended up going their separate ways because they just can't be be with each other. And and in the history of the church, there has and will always be, be conflict because we don't always agree with each other. And in fact, as Matthew is writing this gospel, the, the church that he is writing to is is in a, a place that Matthew is prompted to remember the conversation Jesus has with them about conflict because the church is in, in conflict. There's already a whole number of schisms in the church as Matthew is writing. Um, and, and they're trying to work out who they are in regards to the Jewish faith. They're trying to work out who they are as believers because he is writing to the Jews. They're trying to work out who they are as believers in relationship to to Jerusalem and to the rituals that that they have grown up keeping. So, you know, where do we fit in with this now? And so there's a whole lot of disagreement about who they are as believers, who they are as Jews, who they are as those who have grown up worshiping God in one way. And, and Jesus has introduced a whole lot of stuff um, that is that is not always congruent with what they have grown up believing, grown up doing. And so there is a whole lot of conflict in in, in Matthew's community, as, as Matthew writes this gospel, as Matthew puts this into the gospel, it is, it is to address those issues. And so as Matthew writes this gospel, obviously it is relevant to his community because he is writing it to his community. But it remains relevant for us. All of scripture remains relevant for us because we are the same people going through the same kind of thing. Um, we have the same conflict within ourselves. We have the same conflict amongst ourselves. We, we misunderstand God in the same way that people through our time have, have misunderstood God. We have the same up-down relationship with God that, that they have had. And that's what makes, makes all of Scripture so relevant to us. But in order for, for the gospel to, to come alive to, to people today, the gospel needs to be proclaimed by by an authentic church, by, by an authentic individual, um, by, by a church that is willing to, to work at unity without the need to destroy diversity. Uh, it's, it's proclaimed by an individual who is willing to work at unity without needing to destroy diversity. The way that we deal with our conflict, the way that we deal with our differences, with our misunderstandings as communities of faith, you know, that that is our witness to the God who has made peace with us. And, and often it becomes a challenge 
to our witness of this God who has made peace with us. Because in this world, the one who has the strongest voice, the one who is, is the most convincing in their argument, the one who is the most aggressive, the one who is able to manipulate people the most, um, they are the ones who, who win. But in the kingdom of God, it is the one with the greatest love who, who stands as victor over, over everyone else. Aggression is how I win, but love is, is how we win. We can never, ever be united through, through force. That's just being beaten into submission. We can only be united through, through love. We can only be united even though we remain diverse when we are united through, through love. Using the darkness to fight against the darkness just makes us dark. Using violence to end violence just makes us violent. Um, using aggression to ensure love and mutual respect means we've already lost before we start because we have become like the world that we seek to be a, a light in. And, and if I tell you that somebody in, in the community of faith or somebody outside of the community, of faith, if I tell you that somebody is, is a gossip, then I have become what I stand opposed to. If I say that, that this one is failing in their Christian walk, then I too am failing in that very moment because I haven't approached them and had the conversation with them before I've approached somebody else. Um, obviously, when I, before I approach them, I pray about it seriously because we need God's help in, in discerning the difference between right and wrong. We need God's help to give us the words. We need God's help to guide us in our conversations with people when we, when we come to point out sin, when we come to help them in, in their failures because maybe they don't have sin. Maybe the sin is is ours and the way we believe they need to be be doing things and we do this as churches even if it's unintentionally this is this is where we are meant to learn how to love properly because when somebody points out what we are doing we we've got an opportunity to reflect we've got an opportunity to come consider what it is we're doing and if it is unhealthy we have an opportunity to repent we we have an opportunity to be restored to relationship and we have an opportunity to to to, to bring healing into places we have brought brokenness. And this is why Jesus is having this conversation with his disciples, because one of the greatest obstacles to our worship of God being authentic um, as a community of faith is our ability to be faithful to, to each other. Because if, if you have an issue, um, you need to approach that person after, after you have brought it to God. Um, because again, you need to be in, in prayer with God. Don't just proclaim judgment on somebody. Have a conversation with God first. And when you've had the conversation with God, then you approach that person. And, and if they don't want to enter into the conversation, says Jesus, then take along somebody that they trust. Take along somebody who, who is going to be neutral in the, in the argument that you're having between the two of you. You know, because if it is an unintentional sin, if, if it is a misunderstanding, if it is a sin of ignorance, you know, the first time you, you correct me, um, I should be able to appreciate what, what it is you are, are saying. That's, that's what social holiness is all about. That's why we, we come together as communities of faith to help each other worship God, but also to help each other go on to holiness. A part of that is holding each other accountable for our journey um, and correcting each other when we are getting lost in our journey. And so when you correct me, I have an opportunity to reflect on, on my own life and my relationship with God and, and where I'm going with that relationship. What kind of disciple am I of, of Christ? Am I being the disciple that Christ needs me, me to be? And I might not agree with you in what it is you say to me, but at least we are both open to the conversation. And, and you will know that there is nothing more unhealthy in the life of a church than a parking lot conversation, you know, than a, a small group jury that sets somebody up for, for judgment because that person is already condemned before, before you've even gone to the trouble to have the conversation with them. And so Jesus says, go to them on your own. Always speak to God first, have a conversation with God. Jesus says, go to them on your own, have a conversation one-on-one. -on -one. And, and if, if they still don't see what it is that they are doing, then, then take somebody else with you. Take somebody, obviously, that, that they trust. Um, take one of their friends or take one of their elders, somebody who is impartial. Don't take a posse with you. Don't take a jury with you. Um, and you're taking this person with you so that they can confirm the matter if the two of you are unsure of whether it's a sin or not. Um, the other person, the third person, is, is meant to help you discern where, where the truth lies.
And so as Jesus gives direction to, to, to the disciples for restoring a sinner, for, for healing relationships, it's also a very good way of discerning what the source of, of the sin is. You know, if it's a misunderstanding or if it's unintentional or even if it is intentional, but it's done out of anger or, or out of revenge, it becomes easier to solve as you go through these steps. Um, but if it is pride, it gets more difficult to solve as you go through these steps. And so by the time you bring um, this believer to, to the, the assembled community, and again, the churches in, in, by the time Matthew's writing this gospel, the churches are house churches. So maximum 20 people, 25 at a push, um, not, not 100, 200, 5,000 strong churches. So you're bringing it to a group of people who know you, who are in relationship with you. Um, and so by the time you bring it to them, by the time you get to that place where you actually need to bring it to them, then there's a pretty good chance that pride is the actual sin that is hiding behind this issue that you are in conflict about. As Jesus has this conversation with the disciples about believers who sin, um, again, the conversation is not about judgment. The conversation is about resolving the issue. The conversation is about ensuring the sanctity of the relationship that exists within the body of Christ. It is about restoring the person to the body of Christ. And you know, what a joy it is to, to be a part of a conversation that sets somebody free from their sin. And, and what a great condemnation it is on our conscience in having a parking lot conversation and binding somebody to their sin without giving them an opportunity to repent. And, and restoration, as Jesus speaks about restoring the believer to the community of faith, restoration is about forgiveness. Forgiveness is, is setting the accused free, and unforgiveness keeps them locked to their crime forever with us. You know, we are going to hold them to their sin for, forever. And so Jesus says to his disciples, if they refuse to repent, then you need to treat them like a Gentile. You need to treat them like a tax collector. And, we, and again, we remember this gospel is being written by Matthew who is a tax collector. How did Jesus treat Matthew? How does Jesus treat the Gentiles? How does Jesus treat tax collectors? He heals them. And he continues to, to invite them into discipleship with him. The focus is on unity. The focus is on restoration to the community. The focus is never, ever about condemnation. We, we do want community. We yearn for community. But real community takes effort. Real community takes, takes work because it's made up of imperfect people. It's made up of, of people who are difficult. It's made up of people who, who are challenging. It's made up of people who are unreliable. You know, even friends argue as they learn how to be friends. They argue as they learn how to adjust in, in their relationship with each other, as they learn how to grow in their relationship with each other. Um, husband and wife argue as they learn how to be a married couple, as they learn how to think as, as one. But what makes people community is when they're able to have these arguments, when they're able to struggle and wrestle with each other and, and still stay together. Conflicts and, and, and disagreements are always going to exist, but, but they don't need to be divisive. You know, it should be an instrument of growth. It should be an instrument of development. It should be an instrument of understanding God better, of understanding each other better. And so, so conflict, um, disagreements are, are not necessarily a bad thing, but the way in which we resolve the conflict, the way in which we resolve the disagreement can be a bad thing. If we're aggressive and we are going to force our way and proclaim judgments and condemn, we destroy the church. If we pretend that the conflict doesn't exist, if we pretend that, that there isn't something that is getting in the way of our relationship. If, if there is hidden conflict, that also destroys the church. That also destroys the power of the gospel that we find in the church because we, we commit ourselves to being nice to each other instead of committing ourselves to be, to be loving, to be honest with each other, to, to genuinely care about each other's life and each other's faith and each other's growth in, in discipleship. And so the way in which we handle conflict um, determines how we witness to the God who makes peace with us. And so as Jesus has this conversation with the disciples about how to deal with a believer who, who is sinning, who is destroying instead of building up, it is an incredibly difficult conversation for the disciples to hear. Because like them, we also just want to proclaim judgment instead of bringing healing. Like them, we also want to pretend that it doesn't exist instead of bringing healing. And so Christ calls us to a discipleship that is costly. 
Do the work of keeping your hearts open to others. Do the work of restoring community. Do the work of reconciling people to each other for the sake of the gospel of reconciliation. Let's pray. Lord God, please forgive us for those times where, where we have believed that we hold the power to judge others according to your law. Forgive us for those times where we have believed that others cannot possibly be loved by you. Forgive us for those times where we have driven others further from you and from us by the way in which we have handled our differences with them. Forgive us for the way in which we have failed to, to resolve our differences in a way that is restorative, but have instead gone to resolve our differences in a way that is either defensive or offensive. Give us the grace, Lord Jesus, to do the hard work of loving others, especially when we find them difficult to love. Give us the grace to love as you love, with a love that is healing, with a love that is restoring, with a love that, that, that ensures the sanctity of the relationship that exists between us, with a love that brings peace to your people. We pray this in your precious name. Amen.